In a world where 99% of people are desperately trying to fit in, the 1% understand that success is found when you stand out from the crowd. I'm Jack Henderson, and this is the Flamingo Sundays podcast. If you're looking for the 99%, you're in the wrong place. This week on Flamingo Sundays, we have the very successful entrepreneur, Simon Beard. Simon is the co-founder and the CEO of international streetwear empire, Culture Kings. He built the business with his wife, Tani, from very humble beginnings, where they started out selling cameras and clothing at the markets. In 2021, Culture Kings was valued at over $600 million, and Simon took a partial exit where he took $300 million off the table. And in this podcast, we unpack everything from Simon being a young kid learning entrepreneurship off his neighbor all the way through to $300 million hitting his bank account and everything in between. Simon Beard, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. What comes to mind when you hear that? Uh, for me, this definitely quite resonates a lot. I know when I was at the markets and I was selling and I got really good at selling and sales, but I realized like to this point, oh, if I don't train someone else to do this and I'd, I'd, I had a few goes at it, training some kid and then I'd just be like after 30 seconds, get out of the way, just let me do it. Like <laughs> if, you're effing it up. And then I would realize like, okay, if I don't train this, and build it i'm just going to be stuck here and just be a carny for my whole life and i realized i had to train it but as well it's passing on that skill and that knowledge i know how how impactful you know it's such a great feeling when you give someone a real tangible skill and then they use it and you see them uplift their life so and and the reason that i i guess said that quote was from my understanding you've never been someone that's worked for someone else you've always been someone who's been self-sufficient run your own businesses and uh and essentially you taught yourself how to fish so you'd never have to you know work for someone else and yeah work for the man yeah yeah i had a goal in uh grade 10 at school i wrote down i'm like i want to be an entrepreneur my whole life i never want to work a job um yeah that was always my in internal motivation i, I just love that idea i had this neighbor who was big kev and he was on tv selling like these as seen on tv products and he was like <laughs> this real famous like like daniel's director yeah, yeah yeah and he'd sell this cleaning products oh, i'm excited and he and he was i did this business project with him in year 10 where i interviewed him on the old vhs and and then um from that he just he sold me on being an entrepreneur of this whole thing of like running your own ship you know being like just describing it you know like you're going out in the arena you know with your sword and you're battling it you know every day and i just i felt such a connection of like oh man i want to be like that and that's when i wrote the goal and yeah i followed his footsteps because my first straight out of school i started the markets and i took over his old stall that he had there <laughs> Yeah, so, right. Yeah. So that, that's where he, uh, that's where he ground his teeth yeah. was at the market. He started the market and he was like the really good salesman and moved up onto as seen on TV selling. And yeah, that was huge in the day. So what else would we need to understand about your upbringing and your childhood to understand the, the journey that you've gone on today? Uh, I suppose I, from my childhood like i grew up in mount isa it's a mining town and then i came to the gold coast when i was like 10 and yeah i was really lucky that my parents really sacrificed to send me to an awesome school there tss um and i really embraced the learning side and i really applied a lot of effort i, I know i wasn't the smartest sort of kid there but i always sort of had strong work ethic there uh but then i really like yeah from that year 10 part really just focused on being an entrepreneur and, and then i just love that selling something like that feeling of of making money you know whether it was selling phones or selling driver's license tests or answers or or anything it was just like oh such a rush i don't know 
I did, thrived on it. Did your parents run their own businesses or were they entrepreneurs? Yeah. So they, my parents worked for their parents that were big in the, in, they actually had this big retail store in Mount Isa. Right. And my parents worked for them. And then once we moved to the Gold Coast, they did their own um, thing, different uh, retail, furniture, and even they had a, they had an original sort of surf store as well. Um, so I definitely feel I had retail in my, in my blood. Um, and, but what I was so lucky with them is he, he very, he was able to, my dad was able to step away and my mum and spend a lot of time with me. And now I know that how valuable that is because, you know, in that, well, just not many kids got that as much time with their parents that mm. I know I did. It was very lucky. And it sounds like the, the school that you went to was a good school for the area. Yeah. Did you always have the idea that you wanted to, I guess, start and, and run a business before you had the time with, uh, with Big Kev? Uh, I suppose I was just like a lot of young boys. I just liked, I loved cars. I loved mm. like dreaming of that lifestyle. Um, I think that's such a big motivator. I still see it today and so much. It's like that, that drive actually comes, Oh, I really want that. Well, how do I get it? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to make money. Okay. And then that becomes the, the fuel. But as that journey into entrepreneurship, I realized I just, I just really loved entrepreneurship. So what do you feel like the, the, the biggest thing that you got from school was? I think like, you know, obviously there's that well sort of rounded education across it, but it's the most important thing is the discipline mm. is that you've got to stick something out and finish it. And, you know, you've got to deliver something on time and like, you've got to build that discipline as much as people can disregard it. Oh yeah. You don't learn anything, but it's like how you do one thing is how you do everything. You know, it's like you need to be able to build that, discipline and i think that school definitely did that for me and i feel i was quite well disciplined leaving so uh, i guess the discipline as a whole um what does that i guess mean to to you as a person because i guess for most people discipline is probably one of the hardest skills yeah just doing something consistently for a long period of time and not necessarily seeing results either yeah and it's doing the thing that you know you need to do but you don't necessarily want to do. Mm. It's really easy to let your brain, you know, automatically goes to certainty and comfort. Oh, you know, not today, tomorrow and do it. It's that overriding of that. Like, no, I'm going to finish it. No, I'm staying until it's done. No, I'm, I don't care. I don't feel like it. I'm doing it anyway. And that, oh, I, you cannot, I cannot express how valuable that is and yeah, and that's always been at the core. And I'm very intrinsically motivated, you know, like mm. I don't need someone else to tell me like I've done a great job or something. I'll measure that myself and know if I've applied the effort. And I think that's a very important thing, intrinsic motivation, not getting tied too much to the result because sometimes, you know, it's just luck or something that it plays out, but really connecting with you. Well, did you try your hardest? Did you bring out everything that you, you had and, and driving off that motivation rather than being from the external, mm. which a uh, majority of people are. Um, and is that something that is a self-taught skill or, or self-taught discipline or, or is that something that you feel you naturally had growing up? Yeah, I'm not quite sure if that is learnt or maybe it's a, it's a bit of both, probably learnt it a bit and realized how important it is or people that I might and looked up to, I saw that's what they did. And mm. I was like, well, I want to be like that and took on those traits and beliefs. What areas in your life would you say you're the least disciplined? <sighs> that's a good question. Probably, probably still my diet, I reckon. Yeah. I still sort of would out train it, mm. but I still love to like, you know, I, I don't really have that restriction or the, you know, I'll still eat, 
you what's know. what's your go to? What's the, what's the the meal or the or the type of food that always gets you? Oh, I just like a lot of carbs or a lot of, um, you know, it's it's one of the things I know when we when we sold part of the business and we had like this big chunk of money drop. It's this thing that people go, uh, you know, oh, money doesn't buy happiness. But it, I I referred to it this this thing of like, did you ever go like? Remember the first time you went to like you know, the lounge at the airport and, you know, mm. everything's free. And you're like, oh, my God, everything's free, <laughs> right? And that feeling, yeah, it was like that, but everything was free, right? Everything on Uber Eats was free. Everything was like, fuck, yeah, let's get dessert and this and that. And let's get it from three different places. And it was just this um, thing. And I, I suppose that's that was part of the thing. And I noticed when, when we first were doing it on time, I'm like, oh, shit, we got to wind this back. You know, <laughs> we, we're getting out of hand. And, yeah, but... Yeah, discipline would be diet. So it's interesting that you say that. You know, it's a it's a term used a lot in fighting with boxers, right? When they sleep in the silk sheets, it's harder to get up and yeah. and get to work. When you did sell Culture Kings for you know north of six hundred million dollars, did the discipline and the drive in your life change at all? Ah, uh, I was very conscious and aware of it because I'd heard stories and seen people that had told me about people that have gone in that situation. And, you know, it's like you reach this goal that you've always been hunting down. And then mm. when you get there, you sort of go, is this it? You know, and that they have this big drop of dopamine and, you know, people can get depressed and stuff, which just sounds absolutely crazy. But I was really conscious of it, of like, I don't want to, I don't want it to change me. I want it, you know, to just be, this is just part of the journey, part of the next level. And I remember, cause I still do a cold plunge every morning at like 4 a.m., you know, and I haven't missed in like five years. And you know, if I'm traveling, I just do cold showers or whatever. But I remember, you know, the day after the, the transfer and we did the whole thing and we did this celebration and, you know, when the 300 million dropped, I got it into my uh, dollar mite account, my first account. <laughs> and I went, I went to the ATM to do a check balance thing just to get that uh, re receipt as a little bit of a flex. But uh, have you still got that receipt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just, yeah, it was such a pain in the ass to even get it in that account. But it was like, it was just this. But I suppose after it, when my alarm went off at, you know, 4 a.m. to go do the cold punch, the first thought in my head is like, I got 300 bucks, 300 million bucks now. I don't need to do this. It's like, oh shit, that's it already seeping in. You know, that's that exact boxer thing. I'm like, no, fuck it. I'm doing it. You that, know, that internal missing. dialogue. Yeah. And it's, that's that slippery slope you got to sort of watch out for. What did day one look like of, of Culture Kings? You know, you, you you've taken that company from zero, selling it uh, at your local market to you know, uh, one of the largest exits I would say in, in retail in, in Australia. Um, it didn't always look like that. I'm assuming. No. Yeah. I, I was definitely, so I started at the markets and I sold this, uh, first was like this car baby electronic thing that didn't work too good. And then I moved on to this digital camera, which was, I saw was seen on as seen on TV product and I was reverse engineering. selling it. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Like his competitor. And then I, um, so I started selling that and that's when I, you know, I brought this camera and then I was like, oh my God, like, I'm not that good at selling. I need to learn this sort of skills. That's when I first went to Jordan Belfort and really learned his straight line system. And that was like the unlock. And I really started to like make progress and momentum. And, you know, went from a few hundred bucks a weekend to a few thousand. And I was really gaining that confidence in myself. And I just got really good at that at the time. And I even had this moment, you know, I was, I always talk about this flow states create magic. I was like killing it. I just done this massive like day and I was like, fuck, you know what would be a game changer if this camera is just waterproof. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to order. And I hit up the factory. I'm like, oh, can we um make a waterproof case for this? And they're like, oh, we just made one for actually our other customer in the US, but he hasn't paid the patent. I'll send it to you if you want it. You can have it and, and go for it. Anyway, I got the sample there 
and I always talk about this believability way to decision making. You've got to talk to people which have the most context, the most knowledge in that area. Don't get opinions from people that have no context and no knowledge because mm. it'll actually harm you. And I went and showed people, you know, at the markets and stuff. And I was like, oh, look at this. It's waterproof. You know, imagine this taking it surfing or snowboarding. This is going to be a game changer. I'm going to buy this mold. It's only 16 grand. It's going to... And everyone said like, why wouldn't have Canon done that? Why wouldn't have Sony done that? What, how are you going to compete with them? And I was just like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. And like, what are you going to do when it leaks? You're going to have to give everyone's money back. Oh yeah, yeah, way too hard. Right. And I told the factory, no, don't worry about it. Anyway, the factory came back a few months later and said, oh, the guy in America's, you know, started this. He wants to see if he wants to sell your, his camera, the waterproof one in Australia. Um, Anyway, connected us on email. He emailed me. I'm like, oh, you idiot. How are you going to, what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to compete with Sony or Canon? Or what are you going to do when it leaks? And I remember, and that was Nick Woodman, the founder of GoPro. And that was the original sample in like, yeah, in the, in the 2000s. And it was like, oh, uh, it was, I remember. And then from there, like GoPro just blew up. Mm. And I remember I was still selling that camera at the markets. And I was so like, bitter and because i i got so good at selling because the technology kept advancing but i was still selling an old dated technology so it was like this muscle i had to get stronger and stronger and stronger at the sales to be able to do it like um but and i would you know years later go into a harvey norman and see the stand there with the gopro and i just show I was like this idea was exactly in my head i'm like <laughs> but i knew then if I ever had that other opportunity, I'm like, I'm not going to ask anyone's opinion. I'm not going to see what anyone, I'm just going to back myself and I'm just going to run and grab it by the, the hair. You know, when I get that opportunity and just not let it go. And yeah, I, my mate sent me, I was always in a clothes myself, buying streetwear and sneakers for myself. And then my mate sent me this video of Nigel from J Japan that started Bape. And I was like, fuck, this is so cool. He's like, uh, you know, he had the first Bugatti in Japan, mm. first Phantom. He was such a cool uh, character. I was like, man, when I grow up, I want to be like that. And then I was just like, started to research. And I was like, oh, look at this price parity. These dicky shorts selling surf shops here for a hundred bucks, but they're only $16 at Walmart. And the dollar was like dollar ten parity. So I was like, literally sent my mate, brought shorts from Walmart, packed them up in a box, sent them over from America, sold them at the markets, and then just started from there. And just got more products week on week and and eventually built it out and that was the start of culture kinks yeah and that was yeah and, and do you think the the gopro story obviously that's a you know what's what's that worth now 10 billion US well it went up to 10 bill it's fallen back to about 800 so i'm like uh, you know <laughs> i'm sure i'll catch it not as you're, you're yeah. not a, not as sour anymore yeah. but that i guess that learning now and re reflecting back on that did that shape the way that you I guess, acted with Culture Kings as you were moving through the journey? Yeah, I, th I think it gave me that back myself. And, and I think this, this mentality, like people, like, like I would get it a lot. Like, what are you going to do when people stop buying flat broom hats? You know, <laughs> just get the fuck out of the way. You know, like I know this will work. And, and from an early days, I was always like, I could see the other retail stores and I used to stand out the front of them and I'd just go nuts. I'd be like, oh my God, that person working in there is like a space cadet. Like, how's it going today, guys? Up to anything in particular? Like a low warmth, low competence greeting was really common in retail. Mm. And I was just like, dude, that shit is so easy to sell. You have no idea. And they just there like think they look cool and they judge the customer. All these really mistakes in in selling they're just making catastrophic mistakes and i was just like you know what i i swear i i didn't know i was just like i swear i can do this better mm. and yeah from there started with one little store and really ingrained that conversion and sales technique well you know and and we just built it off free cash flow when we had enough money invested in the next thing and and we just so i met my wife uh this was in like 2008 i had this schooly slippers business which was one of my like lifestyle very good stories i like it yeah to be uh yeah I, I had my most fun ever at schoolies and i thought well how can i 
have a reason to go back there. And yeah, it was starting the schoolies merchandise, which is crazy. No one was doing it, but it was just a hotel slipper with Gold Coast schoolies written on it. Like a, you know, a $1 go, uh, hotel slipper, but they sold and, but the first sort of years it was a joke, right? It was just me partying and whatever, but I, I was, I met Tani a few months before we were seeing each other. We weren't officially dating. She got fired from Zaps because this was like right in uh, the GFC. And I was like, oh, you should come help me at the, at schoolies. You know, it's so fun. We sell this. And then I realized like how big a weakness I had, like detailed and reliable. And like, yes, I could come up with creative ideas, but without that glue that, and it was like, it was like a match and we just synced together and it clicked and we just, we sold that many, I think it was almost 50,000 slippers, oh, wow. which was insane. Like I remember that last day, it's like bigger than any Yeezy line today, you know, for these schooly slippers and we, we killed it. And then from there we we're like, I, I think then that was what really triggered that love of, of that hype in streetwear and like, oh, if you can create this hype and this domino effect and, you know, people want what they can't have mm. and, you know, fuel it. It was like, I really loved that. And that, that was my wife and I coming together. And then, yeah, we, we never looked back. We just went on the journey together. And, and just on that, you know, I would say 90 plus percent of people you would ask about business and mixing business and family will say, don't do it. You know, it's a, uh, it's a recipe for disaster. But from hearing what you just said, your relationship with Tani was probably one of the things that grew Culture Kings to the level that it did. A hundred percent, yeah. What, uh, what impact do you think Tani had on, I guess, yourself and then, you know, I guess, directly impacting the, the business? Yeah, I did this speech at my wedding because, you know, we started sharing money. Like I was supposed to owe all this money from schoolies. I didn't, I forgot to pay her and then I paid her back. She didn't have any money because she'd just you know been out of a job and then i was like oh, i'll pay you a thousand bucks a week but then i went three weeks by and i hadn't paid it and then i'm like look let's just share money right <laughs> whatever you need like and we, so we were sharing money literally like three weeks or six weeks in our relationship it was crazy um but i i said this speech of like a lot of people say you know you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket but tani and i put all our eggs in one basket we were all in it together, but we watched that fucking basket like a hawk, mm. you know? And that was the thing as our back against, we had no other, we, we had to be glued at the hip in everything we did. And we sort of very early connected, like we were this and we we're a team and we we're a mission and we, and, and I always say this though, that what she did with me, which I'm, I'm forever grateful for is she just had such this belief in me. Like she would look at me like, oh, I was a genius or something or stuff that, I, and would really back me. And if anyone, like she could be the only one that doubted me. If someone else doubted me, she, they were dead to her. Right. Mm. But like, and this is what happened. Everyone would be yes men to my ideas, but then she would know when she put a foot, that's just stupid. We're not putting stripper poles in the store. You know? <laughs> and it's like, but she would really like, and, and it was this, such this great relationship. And there's this epic, uh, personality test, Ray Dalio, who started the biggest hedge fund of all time he's invested all this money in the most amazing tools for free wrote the book principles but principlesu.com anyone before i interview i get them to do that uh personality test it's free it's better than a myers briggs for like 10 write, grand write that down yeah seriously it's like yeah put it in the show notes principlesu.com <laughs> but that is amazing and you can compare people together and it, that is the crazy part. When you compare Tiny and I, we're exactly opposite. Like for creativity, I'm 98%, she's 2%. But detailed and reliable, she's 98% and I'm 2%. You know, so it's like, it's like when you see that, it's like, oh my God, we are the, the perfect sort of team together. And we, we have these exactly strengths and weaknesses that come. And that is just, you know, that is, uh, and that, that is such a important when you're framing teams and you understand how to work well with your team, you understand your own weaknesses, where you're going to clash. And if you can, you know, project them ahead, you can really, 
you know, it's so much easier mm. to talk through it and you pull out the principles you and see, see, this is exactly where it told us where we'd clash, you know, it's, it's amazing tool. And, and on that, is there a time during the journey where your relationship with Tani, you know, I guess got you through a, a super challenging time? There's, there's definitely lots of those moments I know when, you know, when getting up at five to go to the markets and we've been working all night we only got home at midnight and this and she's just like fuck it let's just not go to and i'm like dragging her out of bed no we're not you know we're going but then other times when you know we've got a big problem and i'm like i don't know how to solve it and it's almost like i want to just pull the covers up and stay under the fucking bed like it's too fucking (laughs) you know she's she would pull me out and you know that was so good to have and and i think the 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 straight and narrow, that's what allowed us. Like I see some other ones too, like uh, guys, I think a bit similar to me, you know, entrepreneur do it. Some of these ones I'm investing, but I'm like, oh man, they really need a Tani. Like, mm. like, cause they're single, they're just getting distracted. They're doing this, you know? And it's like, they, 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 they're getting the ego barrier, you know, where we make mistakes is our ego barrier, usually too high or too low. And it's like, they got blind spots and they don't have anyone that can really check them. And I'm like, I see him, I'm like, oh, you would just like, and I, I really think that for myself is like, I tell her this, I like, I either would have been a billionaire at 25 or be broke, but most likely I would have been broke, you know, <laughs> without her. So, and, and is that a, a common, I guess, um, thing you see with young entrepreneurs or young founders these days that they are lacking potentially that sidekick or that business partner, which fills in the gaps that they miss? Yeah. And it's just the, it can be tempting. Like when you've got that sort of, you know, when you have a little bit of success and you have a little bit of money, it's, it's just so easy as that young male go to your head, you see them all and like, you know, I see it and like, oh, buying supercars and leasing them and then this and bottles have some like, oh, what are you doing? You need to be investing that back into the business. Like you're way too early for that. Mm. I just know for us, we just disciplined, like we, you know, we had times where we would have had 10 million in cash in the bank, but you know, we didn't even, we were still renting. We still, you know, had a, a Jeep, you know, like nothing flash, like just doubling down. And, and mm. yeah, we, we knew it was, uh, we were, and that was just definitely Tani too. I, I, I definitely feel if I didn't have Tani, I would have got distracted by that other stuff. And yeah. Did you have a plan, you know, 10 million bucks in the bank is a, is a pretty strong position to be in. Did you have a plan as to when you would start enjoying the things in life that you probably wanted to enjoy as you were growing the business? It's this, it's this thing is as much as you have 10 million in the bank, but you'll have bills that are 2 million, Mm. right? Or, you know, it's this thing is this pressure in business, you've always got the next thing you've got to invest for, the next store, the next IT upgrade, the next, there's always that role, especially in that growing. Um, and and definitely Tani had that safety net. She was more or less controlling that transfers and stuff. And she was the one that she needed that safety net, you know, say that the wages are, uh, you know, a hundred grand a week or something like shit. We need to be, if something happens to be able to cover this. Cause, mm. and that was, I really feel like it was a little bit conservative when you look back, like, yeah, maybe we could have grown qu- quicker or something, but we built such solid discipline and growth. And I remember when we were doing the deal, like people look like, I was like looking at other ones. I'm like, Oh my God, you don't even make profit. You don't even do this. You don't even produce free cash. And then it was like, Oh my God, we could have grown so much faster if we just borrowed money and scaled that. But I, I do, I, you know, I sort of got, I was like a bit when I first, I was like, Oh, Tony, tell me back. We could have gone faster. And then it was like, it was so touche as we went through 21 and the thing is like, Oh, we were fucking doing it. Absolutely. Right. Solid. Yeah. Yeah. And was there a time during the journey where that conservative approach of having cash at bank, you know, having runway, um, that it actually paid dividends when, when things potentially got tough? A hundred percent. Like, yeah, we had, uh, you know, we'd always have stuff that would, you know, sort of go wrong or mistakes. And we had that, 
buffer to sort of pull you through those times because it was it's always cyclical but you know and as well in 2017 we had a fire and we lost like yeah 10 million dollars in the day the whole warehouse burnt down and 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 uh you know that was chaos um and it was right when we were just like we were just crushing it more than ever mm. and it was so like you know we just thought we were done and we we're like oh my god but uh you know i remember when we went home and you know i got up in the morning still did my cold plunge did my breathing and i was like you know what fuck it if i was back on the street with 50 bucks i know i could build it back i know it in my head like oh this is better than starting with 50 bucks like let's just figure it out and i swear i was more productive in those next three days than i've ever been in my life you know we had the new warehouse within 48 hours we had stock deliveries we had you know brought all the computers the furniture the thing it was this and you know creating this you know uh creating this magic and it was such a i always look back of it you could think it would be like such a a scary sort of time but it mm. was such a i look back of like wow what a magical time like because it was this feeling of camaraderie in the team because like the thing is you cleared out all the dead weight because a lot of people of those staff were like oh this is too hard and just like left automatically like fuck this but the ones that were left were like let's do this mm. right and it just the camaraderie and the team together and it was like and we grew more out of that fire by the end of the year than we'd ever have and it was just like such an eye opener to me like oh my god it's so much was mental in our head and what you're actually truly capable of when you're really stuck in that position you're back against the wall like forced to grow you can yeah self-belief how much has that changed since you were a you know a, a young teenager talking with big kev about uh selling at the markets to to know right now yeah it's it's definitely changed a lot because i think though when i was back then you would look at people and idolize like, oh my god they must know you know they're you know almost like this mythical creature but then the more as you grow you realize you know from the this and the billionaires like everyone's winging it you know <laughs> it's like and there's everyone's got mistakes and problems mm. and stuff to fix and you realize like there is just so much opportunity as well like it can be really easy to think like oh the market's already sorted that out or there's no thing or it's when it's like there is actually opportunity everywhere and that belief of like yeah you can just connect it together and find those gaps and yeah it is that thing is you you start to knock down a lot of those limiting beliefs that you don't realize like just how many we carry naturally around us so many of us yeah and, and the the limiting beliefs are obviously obviously formed in our in our childhood years yeah and then usually stay with us for our whole yeah, lives yeah and it can just be as simple like that's with the jordan belfort seminar last night is like someone like and this is a, a big thing i'm really conscious of parent i've got four kids of like if you say in the wrong tone to a kid like something with absolute certainty and like it like you know you can really that's that's in that can implant the limiting belief right there mm. you know like like i've had this with staff or something and they're like oh i'm no good at computers i'm no good at computers I'm like where the hell does that come from and i swear it's like something's happened you know they've spilt on a keyboard or something and messed it up and someone's gone don't ever touch a computer you know or something someone said that from a p position of authority mm. had said that with absolute certainty at them and bang it's locked in there like i truly reckon that can uh it can happen that easy 100 yeah. percent, and it sounds like you're super conscious of that with with parenting yeah and definitely you know trying to do them the other way of locking those those uplifting beliefs always applauding the effort not the outcome you know and uh it's just so important and yeah but it is it is something that yeah you've got to be so careful because those natural triggers will go to the actually the exact wrong way of doing it so with uh with opportunity like you just said there's opportunity everywhere something that i noticed when i was you know a, a, an adolescent and or a teenager i used to shop at at culture kings and one of the big reasons i would want to shop there is because of all of the famous people that I used to see on MTV yeah, or, yeah, yeah. you know, listen to their music would be in the stores. Yeah, yeah. Um, we now know that to be influencer marketing. Yeah. But back then there wasn't really a term yeah. called influencer marketing. Was that a conscious 
thing that you were doing with leveraging the audiences and, and the brand off famous or, or celebrity people? Yeah, it just sort of, it happened really, it just happened organically. Like one of the super fests was this festival on, on the Gold Coast. We just had this one little store in Southport and one little one in Brisbane. And, you know, all these artists were there, Snoop Dogg, etc. And some of his entourage came in the store. And I was like, oh, do you reckon you could get Snoop here? Anyway, they're like, oh. And I went with them back to the hotel and try and convince the, the tour guys, oh, can you stop by the store on the way? They were going to some barbecue. They had the day off. And they stopped by and all came in the store. Um, and it was incredible. But the problem was they had so much entourage that just basically took all this stuff right <laughs> and we couldn't you know and there's this because snoop came back and we did this video like recapping and this video i'm sitting there talking to the thing but you can see in my eyes he's like don't worry i got you you know this thing is going to be all good but you can see in my eyes i'm shitting my pants and that's because you can hear the beepers going off in the background it's like people are racking shit and i'm like <laughs> try to anyway it but it snoop was so right he goes don't worry it will all be worth it. I'll, you know, I've got you. And he, you know, he posted us on Twitter and stuff and, and back in the day. And yeah, I I really learned the power of it then because then just the hype. And then when the show was in Brisbane, that for Superfest, like a couple of days later, Brisbane, our store, had the biggest day it ever had by like three times. Wow. And I was like, holy hell, like it's just so viral, it's so known. And then... What I tried to do then is then as promoters and artists came to town, how did I set up these opportunities? How did I influence my way into the circle to get them there and, you know, create it? It is, it is a thing that, you know, a lot of these rappers, they need a lot of new clothes, especially when they're traveling. They don't want to do washing and stuff. So, mm. you know, it is, and we, we do have the best stuff and I could just sort of weasel my way in there and, and get them in and, but I still look at some of the deals that I was able to do, you know, like I got Justin Bieber and influenced him to post it on his Instagram and he spent 10 grand in the store, but he but influenced him to post on his Instagram like for free. Like today they'd be worth like a million bucks. Wow. Or, you know, Chris Brown, I bribed his DJ. I'm like, yo, yo you reckon you can get Chris down here? He's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, I'll give you a thousand bucks. He's like, yo, Chris, you got to come check out the store. And then Chris came down and spent six grand. I was like, oh my God, like what a fucking return on investment. Wow. Yeah. So, and we use those and, and yeah. And yeah. And then as those would come, like this was very early days and, and you know, you look back now, it's like, oh my God, it was like they were shooting a TV commercial for me. Really? It was more powerful because it was more authentic. You know, that was what we were always trying to capture. It was not, it wasn't like this set up, hold a bag or hold some product and doesn't mean anything. It was mm. natural. It was them shopping. It was like, it was just like getting product. And and, and then you cool used to play the, all those in, on the TVs yeah, in the stores. Yeah. And it would, you know, it's that thing, create that figure of authority. And I really, what, a key thing was I leveraged that in our funnel, right? Because as online started to say, I'm like, shit, like, understanding the sales process and how I learn, I need to get them in from the top, but I need it to be pull, not push. You know, that's where everyone will buy this, buy this, where I'm like, we just run this clip of all these celebs. It doesn't say anything, but it's just like culture Kings, culture Kings, culture Kings and stop. So, and people would be like, what the fuck's culture Kings, you know? Mm. And it would actually, and that would be the pull. And then people that watch the video, I'd target them. And, you know, I did, I was on Facebook ads since 2010. I was always active in it every day, understanding the funnel, watching the, reading the data, understanding, you know, doing like our hype reel, we would have done hundreds of recuts and edits of it, of just like perfecting of like, this is the watch time, this is the drop, you know, here's one targeted this EDM music, this one's targeted rappers, this one's sports stars. And yeah, but from the top, creating that figure of authority and then underneath, you know, just hit them with the remarketing and the upsell and conversion. Yeah, but- The golden years of Facebook. Yeah, oh Jesus, they were- I, I always used to think, and I was like, oh my God, I'm spending like a thousand dollars a day. This is so much. And I was always thinking, I wonder if I'll regret not spending $10,000 a day. It's like a hundred percent. Oh my God. Dollar CPMs or like, it was like 0.000 cent click through, you know, it was off the, yeah. uh, it was the glory days.
just the, uh, I guess, belief or, or, or discipline to see his entourage in the store and then make the decision to go, hey, there's an opportunity here yeah. and then go to Snoop Dogg's hotel. Yeah. You know, I would say less than 0.01% of people will do that, yeah. mainly because of self-doubt yeah. and, and, you know, I reflect back. I remember Harry Triggerboff to me is like a huge inspiration yeah. in, in property and I was standing next to him at the front of uh, a seminar that he'd just spoken at for the financial review and something inside of my head said, oh no, don't talk to him, don't talk to him. We're standing there waiting for a taxi and I never yeah. spoke to him uh, and I still regret that to that yeah. day. And most people, I think, would, would face the same thing. How come, I guess it sounds like from your perspective, you just made the decision to go, there's an opportunity here. There's a high chance I'll probably get told to fuck off. Yeah. Let's just go and give it a crack. And, and I think that comes, like you learn the lesson, just why you've learned that from Harry. You know if that opportunity comes, you're going to grab it. Mm. Like I had that GoPro story, right? I was sitting there shaking like, motherfucker, this was exactly in my head. Like exactly this, the surfing, the thing. And it was like, and so I sort of, because I'd, I'd had that, that burn, it was like, no, I'm going to, I would, if I was scared, it was almost like the trigger to take action. To mm. go, Fuck it. I'm going to have a go. Like, you know, and I've always wanted to sort of keep that going forward. Cause you never know how those little positive momentums and those steps can go. But I do believe cause the belief i Belief in myself from learning that sales skills and understanding, like I was using those sales skills, you know, the whole way through to influence a landlord, you know, to give us a lease. Like, cause if you go to a landlord and you're like, I'm, I'm a new clothing brand, like there's no higher possible failure rate mm. than fucking a young person starting a clothing brand. It is like off the fucking charts. <laughs> you know, we all know like 20 kids from high school that started a clothing brand. Not one's fucking going. They're there, often right? the ones you see retail yeah. shops come up yeah. brand for six months yeah. and then, you know, fall lease but, again. But it is the thing is that I was able to sell and understand, you know, how to influence them, how to use the right tonality, how to get rapport, how to come off as an expert and that I was different. I'm going to, I'm going to smoke them, you know, I'm going to smoke these old dinosaurs that just put a shoe on the wall and hope someone walks in and say, like, they didn't have fucking Nike. They wouldn't exist. Every one of these motherfuckers would be out of business. You know, I'm going to show them I can do it without it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, that internal sort of belief that was like very combative. And I would train my staff in that way. I'm like, cause I think that's important in business. It's like business is war without the guns. Right. I, I think when two people are too like, like you've got to have this bit of like take it personal like it's us against sort of them and i was mm. always encouraging we would always create um the dinosaur i would always refer to them like they're the they're the dinosaur we're gonna fucking eat all these old you know we're gonna slay them make them extinct and from the early days and it was funny when we we're doing the deal I actually got a i got a bigger offer from one of the dinosaurs you know it was 850 million for a hundred percent and Tony, like, holy shit, should we? Take? And it was like, oh my god. But I was like, oh man. I, and I was, I actually did this whole decision tree. But I was like, if I've got eight hundred fifty million or I've got three hundred million, what am I going to buy that's different? You know, I doubt it. You know, there's no different. And I was like, my whole thing is, I've been saying like with this dinosaur, I did. I can't be going to the team and go. So I sold a hundred percent to the dinosaur. And you just be like, what the fuck? You're the ultimate <laughs> sellout ever. So yeah, that was uh so yeah I so left. you left 250 on the table potentially oh uh, yeah yeah but you know it was uh it i, I wanted to sell half de-risk it mm. and then i was like you know we can sort of let it ride with the rest yeah and you know i i sort of plotted it out off like you know it is this like i unless you're into yachts and planes it doesn't fucking make any difference mm. you've you got to be like you know, there's only one thing than uh, better than owning a boat or a plane, and that's having a mate that owns a boat <laughs> or a plane. So I'll just if I get close enough to someone there, then I don't have to worry. <laughs> but that's a pretty big decision, you know. Like uh, most people, I would say would 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 have chosen the uh, the alternative to to what you did. It sounds like you were you stuck to your word. You know, you, you yeah, didn't... yeah. And it is like I definitely ran that decision matrix. You know. Warren Buffett saying two bird, 
one bird in the hands better than two in the bush you know there's still this risk of these deals of like could it close could the market tank you know we're still going through that murky covid period where it's like you know are these sales artificial like they're just fucking going nuts you mm-hmm. know and and for me part of it i was like always thinking like you know we always went from growing 20 to 40 percent a year to suddenly 100 percent. and i was like did i get 100 percent better <laughs> i don't know yeah. I, have i just fucking ego boosted myself did like because i've never been able to do that before and and yeah that was uh part of the thing it was like you know what let's just sell half and and uh take 300 million cash and the rest in shit. just 300 yeah <laughs> What's the most impactful piece of advice or, or guidance you've you've received to date, whether that is back from when you were a teenager, you know, learning the craft to uh, yesterday at Jordan Belford's event that you uh, that you put on? Uh I it's really hard to narrow it down to one impactful. I feel it's that combination mm. and this never never ending sense of learning is so important. And, you know, I've spent so much money on personal development, but you know, from the Tony Robbins seminars, you know, state management is so crucial from the, uh, you know, Jordan Belfort, that sales system and influence is so like, you just learn the power of tonality and even doing it again last night, I was thinking, I was just saying how much I, I've messed that up with my son in parenting. And it was like, oh my God, it's just the tonality. And you realize like, how we naturally can make such mistakes in that and how impactful the tone that you use is and right through to you know ray dalio i'm a huge fan of his book and and his work like the principles is is huge for me like there's so many that all bring it together for Mm. one sort of piece of advice would only just be to constantly a never-ending learning and making sure you're learning from people that have really walked the walk and achieved it and the best in the world you can sort of cut out so much more than and like it can be f- like anyone that's if there's any sort of sense of this you know like i can see people they just fall for like this get rich quick or this thing and it's like you know drop shipping you know the only way to make money drop shipping is sell a drop shipping course pretty much <laughs> and it's like you know it's just that people going for that easy or that flashy option when when it's like just learn those fundamentals and it may seem like a long time but trust me it's it's not and you build that fundamentals and especially you know in this age with ai and stuff you'll have those opportunities that will open up and if you grab them at the right time and you know when you know you know in that gut like i always think of that i got that feeling with that gopro one and i was so um you know, I was angry at myself for not doing it. And yeah, one thing learned. that you, you said that really resonated with me was around, you know, the trigger buff thing and you with the GoPro. Um, and it sounds like you, you know, and Tom Panos, who's been on the podcast before I said it actually, often the, the, the best gifts in life come badly wrapped. So yeah. something that may seem like, you know, a massive punch in the guts or a huge mistake um, can often be setting you up for what will be your biggest success because of that learning exactly. if you take it on board. A hundred percent, yeah. What's uh, what's next for for Simon Beard? Uh so so for me, I like I still have such a love and a and a passion for streetwear. But I think how I was able to be so successful is that especially when I've seen so many others in the clothing business, you know, come and go and sort of not be as like. I love the clothes, but I love entrepreneurship more. Mm. And that was a special element. And my more thing is, you know, for me, I'm still on the board. I still own, you know, like 20% of the public company, AKA. But for me, I was like, I wanted to sort of, I went deep down the rabbit hole when ChatGPT came out. And I really was like, oh my God, like I really felt like, holy shit, this AI is going to change everything. And I wanted to get hands on the tools deep in it. A bit like when Facebook ads came out, I knew at the start, I'm like, oh, this this just has to smoke TV. Like you, can, you have no idea on a TV ad where the fuck it's going or mm-hmm. who's watching it, where this is like exact it. And then they can click through and you can target by age, by demographic, by location. And I was like, this, this just has to, you know, from first principles change. And I lent into it i'm like i'm going to learn every column 
on this sheet? What does every single little bit of data mean? What does everything? And I sort of felt that moment with AI and it started to evolve over last year and, and the start of this year. And I was like, in sort of running and, you know, public company and all the sort of meetings and US, I was just like, you know what, this is going to be way better if I step out of the day today and I want to go real deep, learn and get my hands on the tools and understand and really touch and feel it, how it connects together. Because it's a bit like, I think Chamath put this so good with AI. It's like, it's a bit like when the refrigerator came out, like you don't know all these big companies that, that, uh, famous for refrigeration, but Coke made its whole business off refrigeration. Mm. And that's going to be even more so with AI, right? It's like with the open source, with it's not so much about investing in AI companies, but how you use it and piece it together. And I really feel it's going to be so revolutionary. And for me, like, I just love entrepreneurship. I love investing in new entrepreneurs. And for me, I really want to understand and get my hands dirty and and do it and, and leverage the time where I can, you know, do exactly what I want to do. And, you know, I suppose that was part of the thing is like, you know, and I had to be on a meeting, I had to be on a thing. It's like, you know, it's the thing too, when you have 300 million, <laughs> now I can tell you, you got to be anywhere, you know, yeah. you do whatever you want to do. So I was like, no, I'll, I'll just want to learn this and do this and, you know, try and influence as much as I can from the board and stuff. But, um, I, I do see just such a fundamental change in how so many areas of business are going to be revolutionized. I don't think anyone's ready for how quick it's going to come. And I do think this is, it's not going to be the big companies eating the slow. It's going to be the fast beating the slow. And those big companies, I know when they're big, I know people aren't going to sign their own death certificate as an employee. They're not going to automate all their own shit and then go, I've got no job. Only those really, those real, you know, like, and this is the advice to people out there is that use those innovations, come up with it, prove that you've done it and then take on the next task. Like we've all got to go to that high level thinking. Mm. That's how we create even more value. And this is where there's going to be so much opportunity. And, and I sort of feel those bigger companies may be slower to uptake it and you could just, do it and slot it and grab market share and yeah in this changing world and i've got a few like investments going right now but nothing that i'm like nothing where i'm in it balls to the wall driving like this is going to the moon yet i'm mm. still learning and understanding it and working out um staying as close to the market and it is great too because i can still spend that extra sort of family time when we go on some mad holidays with the kids and stuff and i'm like oh my god i can't believe i i didn't uh i didn't do this as much you know it, it was i was a bit annoyed at myself as like you know we did the deal in april 21 and we sort of never took we do, only did a a couple of small little holidays and i'm like what the hell like you know this is we can do it you know this. make the most of it yeah and and yeah with that window I want to make sure I do that as well. Real estate, just to, to, to finish it off, you know, you've been pretty active in the, in the, uh, the Queensland market. Yeah. Bought probably my favorite penthouse in, uh, yeah, in yeah. Queensland <laughs> at the top of the, uh, the Seoul building. What is your investment strategy coming off the back of the deal now? It sounds like you've obviously invested in a lot of startups and, and, and are pushing founders along. Yeah. My sort of thing was like, when I sat back and look at the real estate market, I'm like, there is 100% going to be houses sold on the Gold Coast for 50, 60, 70 million dollars, right? But there isn't those houses yet, right? And this is because there's just like founders like me, there's going to be other ones come like billion dollar companies started with six people and thing. And then if someone has that money drop, there's no better thing to spend it on than a fucking house, you know? And that... And I do think that top end of the market, like really, so I really was after how can I get these ones that are, you just can't replace Scarce. basically. Yeah. And so that's, I've only got the, 
you know, the two big ones. Yeah, with the Seoul Penthouse, which is a thousand square meters, four levels. Like no developer would ever make that again. If you ask Harry, just be like, that is insane, right? Why would you block off the whole f- top four levels? And it's a thousand square meters and, you know, it's the most prime position. And the, the guy like who fitted it, did it to the absolute, you know, spent three million on cabinetry. It's insane. It's so good. Um, yeah, we love it. And I was always like, yeah, we, we just were in this bidding and auction and I was telling him, I'm like, oh, I just know you could not replace this for this money. You could not build it. And now even more so with building costs, like, yeah. Game it, over. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, a, it's a special one. And then our other um, big one we're doing on Isle Capri, we're renovating and it's, it's crazy. And yeah, we brought the house next door and made it bigger and just totally, re- it's, it will be, uh, yeah, it's, it's my... Uh, full dream you know like i've got the the crazy gym and the cryo chamber and the new thing that makes nitrogen so i don't even have to get it delivered and you know the ice plunge the cold plunge steam room sauna you know like the crazy it's so oh i can't wait till it's done a couple more months but yeah that's but i i do believe like those big ones like yeah not hopefully we never have to fucking sell it but i, I do think that's where actually those biggest gains are and agreed yeah What's one thing I haven't asked you? Mm. I don't know. What's my regret or something? Tell us. Oh, well, I suppose though, in doing it, like, you know, through those 20s and stuff, like I do look back as Tony and I was so disciplined and so doubled down. I do think... Some of those ones, we could have gone on a few more trips and a few more holidays. And we, we, we canceled so many, right? We got to it and we were so hands-on in every part of the business. We thought if we turned our back for a day, it would like fall over, which a lot of small businesses fucking will, right? They, they, until they get to that point, you got to cross the chasm. But I do think when I look back, you know, in our times, I was like, oh, we should have gone on that trip. We should have done that. Like we got it and we, oh, and we, we thought and, and and yeah those were the ones but I, I do think you know for where we are now we can catch up on it but you know it is that it is that balance of you do only have those those years do go by and it is something too why i did you know part of the way of stepping away is i've i've met you know all these billionaires and stuff but they can be on this constant chase of the next and the next but you know, it's it's almost like this crazy ad- addiction, obsession that doesn't, you know, and I do feel like, you know, there's there's an art and science to everything. There's mm-hmm. an art to making money. There's an art to spending it, you know, there's <laughs> learning both sides of it. So balance. Yeah. Mate, there was some absolute gold in that. I really appreciate you taking the time out no. in between a hectic, uh, hectic schedule with Jordan Belford in the country no. with the One Life Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get you some tickets tonight if you want to come. The guy's a fucking Jedi, I tell you. Tonality. You have no idea how, how important that is in communication and how we get so trained to do it all wrong. Gold. Mate, thanks so Cheers. much for taking the time. Thanks. This is general advice and does not take into consideration your objectives, situation, or needs. You should consider if this advice is suitable to you or your circumstances, and please read any applicable PDS beforehand. This is a Henderson podcast production.